part one of my buried treasure this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by carolyn my buried treasure by richard harding davis part one this is a true story of a search for buried treasure the only part that is not true is the name of the man with whom i searched for the treasure unless i keep his name out of it he will not let me write the story and as it was his expedition and as my share of the treasure is only what i can make by writing the story i must write as he dictates i think the story should be told because our experience was unique and might be of benefit to others and besides i need the money there is however no argument preventing me from describing him as i think he is or reporting as accurately as i can what he said and did as he said and did it for purposes of identification i shall call him edgar powell the last name has no significance but the first name is not chosen at random the leader of our expedition the head and brains of it was and is the sort of man one would address as edgar no one would think of calling him ed or eddie any more than he would consider slapping him on the back we were together at college but as six hundred other boys were there at the same time that gives no clue to his identity since those days until he came to see me about the treasure we had not met all i knew of him was that he had succeeded his father in manufacturing unshrinkable flannels of course the reader understands that is not the article of commerce he manufactures but it is near enough and it suggests the line of business to which he gives his life's blood it is not similar to my own line of work and in consequence when he wrote me on the unshrinkable flannels official writing-paper that he wished to see me in reference to a matter of business of mutual benefit i was considerably puzzled a few days later at nine in the morning an hour of his own choosing he came to my rooms in new york city except that he had grown a beard he was as i remembered him thin and tall but with no chest and stooping shoulders he wore eyeglasses and as of old through these he regarded you disapprovingly and wearily as though he suspected you might try to borrow money or even joke with him as with edgar i had never felt any temptation to do either this was irritating but from force of former habit we greeted each other by our first names and he suspiciously accepted a cigar then after fixing me both with his eyes and with his eyeglasses and swearing me to secrecy he began abruptly our mills he said are in new bedford and i own several small cottages there and in fair haven i rent them out at a moderate rate the other day one of my tenants a portuguese sailor was taken suddenly ill and sent for me he had made many voyages in and out of bedford to the south seas whaling and he told me on his last voyage he had touched at his former home at tenerife there his grandfather had given him a document that had been left him by his father his grandfather said it contained an important secret but one that was of value only in america and when he returned to that continent he must be very careful to whom he showed it he told me it was written in a kind of english he could not understand and that he had been afraid to let any one see it he wanted me to accept the document in payment of the rent he owed me with the understanding that i was not to look at it and that if he got well i was to give it back 
if he pulled through he was to pay me in some other way but if he died i was to keep the document about a month ago he died and i examined the paper it purports to tell where there is buried a pirate's treasure and added edgar gazing at me severely and as though he challenged me to contradict him i intend to dig for it had he told me he contemplated crossing the rocky mountains in a baby right or leading a cotillon i could not have been more astonished i am afraid i laughed aloud you i exclaimed search for buried treasure my tone visibly annoyed him even the eyeglasses radiated disapproval i see nothing amusing in the idea edgar protested coldly it is a plain business proposition i find the outlay will be small and if i am successful the returns should be large at a rough estimate about one million dollars even to-day no true american at the thought of one million dollars can remain covered his letter to me had said for our mutual benefit i became respectful and polite i might even say abject after all the ties that bind us in those dear old college days are not likely to be disregarded if i can be of any service to you edgar old man i assured him heartily if i can help you find it you know i shall be only too happy with regret i observed that my generous offer did not seem to deeply move him i came to write you in this matter he continued stiffly because you seemed to be the sort of person who would be interested in a search for buried treasure i am i exclaimed always have been have you he demanded searchingly any practical experience i tried to appear at ease but i knew then just how the man who applies to look after your furnace feels when you ask him if he can also run a sixty horse-power dynamo i have never actually found any buried treasure i admitted but i know where lots of it is and i know just how to go after it i endeavoured to dazzle him with expert knowledge of course i went on airily i am familiar with all the expeditions that have tried for the one on cocos island and i know all about the peruvian treasure on trinidad and the lost treasures of jalisco near guadalajara and the sunken galleon on the grand cayman and when i was on the isle of pines i had several very tempting offers to search there and the late captain boynton invited me but interrupted edgar in a tone that would tolerate no trifling you yourself have never financed or organized an expedition with the object in view of oh that part's easy i assured him the fitting out part you can safely leave to me i assumed a confidence that i hoped he might believe was real there's always a tramp steamer in the erie basin i said that one can charter for any kind of adventure and i have the addresses of enough soldiers of fortune filibusters and professional revolutionists to man a battleship and fine fellows in a tight corner and i'll promise you they'll follow us to hell and back that exclaimed edgar is exactly what i feared i beg your pardon i exclaimed that's exactly what i don't want said edgar sternly i don't intend to go into any tight corners i don't want to go to hell i saw that in my enthusiasm i had perhaps alarmed him i continued more temperately any expedition after treasure i pointed out is never without risk you must have discipline and you must have picked men suppose there's a mutiny suppose they'll try to rob us of the treasure on our way home 
we must have men we can rely on and men who know how to pump a winchester i can get you both and bannermen will furnish me with anything from a pair of leggings to a quick firing gun and on clark street they'll quote me a special rate on ship stores hydraulic pumps divers helmets edgar's eyeglasses became frosted with cold condemnatory scorn he shook his head disgustedly i was afraid of this he murmured i endeavoured to reassure him a little danger i laughed only adds to the fun i want you to understand exclaimed edgar indignantly there isn't going to be any danger there isn't going to be any fun this is a plain business proposition i asked you those questions just to test you and you approached the matter exactly as i feared you would i was prepared for it in fact he explained shamefacedly i've read several of your little stories and i find they run to adventure and blood and thunder they are not of the analytical school of fiction judging from them he added accusingly you have a tendency to the romantic he spoke reluctantly as though saying i had a tendency to epileptic fits or the morphine habit i am afraid i was forced to admit that to me pirates and buried treasure always suggest adventure and your criticism of my writings is well observed others have discovered the same fatal weakness we cannot all i pointed out manufacture unshrinkable flannels at this compliment to his more fortunate condition edgar seemed to soften i grant you he said that the subject has almost invariably been approached from the point of view you take and what he demanded triumphantly has been the result failure or at least before success was attained a most unnecessary and regrettable loss of blood and life now on my expedition i do not intend that any blood shall be shed or that anybody shall lose his life i have not entered into this matter hastily i have taken out information and mean to benefit by other people's mistakes when i decided to go on with this he explained i read all the books that bear on searches for buried treasure and i found that in each case the same mistakes were made and that then in order to remedy the mistakes it was invariably necessary to kill somebody now by not making those mistakes it will not be necessary for me to kill any one and nobody is going to have a chance to kill me you propose that we fit out a schooner and sign on a crew what will happen a man with a sabre cut across his forehead or with a black patch over one eye will inevitably be one of that crew and as soon as we sail he will at once begin to plot against us a cabin boy who the conspirators think is asleep in his bunk will overhear their plot and will run to the quarter-deck to give warning but a pistol-shot rings out and the cabin boy falls at the foot of the companion ladder the cabin boy is always the first one to go after that the mutineers kill the first mate and lock us in our cabin and take over the ship they will then broach a cask of rum and all through the night we will listen to their drunken howlings and from the cabin airport watch the body of the first mate rolling in the lee scuppers but you forget i protested eagerly there is always one faithful member of the crew who edgar interrupted me impatiently i have not overlooked him he said he is a jamaica negro of gigantic proportions or the ship's cook but he always gets his too and he gets it good they throw him to the sharks then we all camp out on a desert island inhabited only by goats and we build a stockade and the mutineers come to trade with us under a white flag 
and we trusting entirely to their honour are fools enough to go out and talk with them at which they shoot us up and withdraw laughing scornfully edgar fixed his eye-glasses upon me accusingly am i right or am i wrong he demanded i was unable to answer the only man continued edgar warmly who ever showed the slightest intelligence in the matter was the fellow in the gold bug he kept his mouth shut he never let any one know that he was after buried treasure until he found it that's me now i know exactly where this treasure is and i suppose involuntarily i must have given a start of interest for edgar paused and shook his head slyly and cunningly and if you think i have the map on my person now he declared in triumph you'll have to guess again really i protested i had no intention not you perhaps said edgar grudgingly but your japanese valet conceals himself behind those curtains follows me home and at night i haven't got a valet i objected edgar merely smiled with the most aggravating self-sufficiency it makes no difference he declared no one will ever find that map or see that map or know where that treasure is until i point to the spot your caution is admirable i said but what i jeered makes you think you can point to the spot because your map says something like through the sunken valley to which is cauldron four points north by northeast to gallows hill where the shadow falls at sunrise fifty fathoms west fifty paces north as the crow flies to the seven wells how the deuce i demanded is any one going to point to that spot it isn't that kind of map shouted edgar triumphantly if it had been i wouldn't have gone on with it it's a map any one can read except a half-caste portuguese sailor it's as plain as a laundry bill it says he paused apprehensively and then continued with caution it says at such and such a place there is a something so many somethings from that something are three what you may call ems and in the centre of these three what you may call ems is buried the treasure it's as plain as that even with the few details you have let escape you i said i could find that spot in my sleep i don't think you could said edgar uncomfortably but i could see that he had mentally warned himself to be less communicative and he went on i am willing to lead you to it if you subscribe to certain conditions edgar's insulting caution had ruffled my spirit why do you think you can trust me i asked haughtily and then remembering my share of the million dollars i added in haste i accept the conditions of course as you say one has got to take some risk edgar continued but i feel sure he said regarding me doubtfully you would not stoop to open robbery i thanked him well until one is tempted said edgar one never knows what he might do and i've simply got to have one other man and i picked on you because i thought you could write about it i see i said i am to act as the historian of the expedition that will be arranged later said edgar what i chiefly want you for is to dig can you dig he asked eagerly i told him i could but that i would rather do almost anything else i must have one other man repeated edgar a man who is strong enough to dig and strong enough to resist the temptation to murder me the retort was so easy that i let it pass besides 
on edgar it would have been wasted i think you will do he said with reluctance and now the conditions i smiled agreeably you are already sworn to secrecy said edgar and now you agree in every detail to obey me implicitly and to accompany me to a certain place where you will dig if i find the treasure you agree to help me guard it and convey it to wherever i decide it is safe to leave it your responsibility is then at an end one year after the treasure is discovered you will be free to write the account of the expedition for what you write some magazine may pay you what it pays you will be your share of the treasure of my part of the million dollars which i had hastily calculated could not be less than one-fifth i had already spent over one hundred thousand dollars and was living far beyond my means i had bought a farm with a water-front on the sound a motor-boat and as i was not sure which make i preferred three automobiles i had at my own expense produced a play of mine that no manager had appreciated and its name in electric lights was already blinding broadway i had purchased a hollander express rifle a real amber cigarette holder a private secretary who could play both ragtime and tennis and a fur coat so edgar's generous offer left me naked when i had again accustomed myself to the narrow confines of my flat and the jolt of the surface cars i asked humbly is that all i get why should you expect any more demanded edgar it isn't your treasure you wouldn't expect me to make you a present of an interest in my mills why should you get a share of my treasure he gazed at me reproachfully i thought you'd be pleased he said it must be hard to think of things to write about and i'm giving you a subject for nothing i thought he remonstrated you'd jump at the chance it isn't every day a man can dig for buried treasure that's all right i said perhaps i appreciate that quite as well as you do but my time has a certain small value and i can't leave my work just for excitement we may be weeks months how long do you think we behind his eyeglasses edgar winked reprovingly that is a leading question he said i will pay you all your legitimate expenses transportation food lodging it won't cost you a cent and you write the story with my name left out he added hastily it would hurt my standing in the trade he explained and get paid for it i saw a sea voyage at edgar's expense i saw palm leaves coral reefs i felt my muscles aching and the sweat run from my neck and shoulders as i drove my pick into the chest of gold i'll go with you i said we shook hands on it when do we start i asked now said edgar i thought he wished to test me he had touched upon one of my pet vanities you can't do that with me i said my bags are packed and ready for any place in the wide world except the cold places i can start this minute where is it the gold coast the ivory coast the spanish main edgar frowned inscrutably have you an empty suitcase he asked why empty i demanded to carry the treasure said edgar i left mine in the hall we will need two and your trunks i said there aren't going to be any trunks said edgar from his pocket he had taken a folder of the new jersey central railroad if we hurry he exclaimed we can catch the ten thirty express and return to new york in time for dinner and what about the treasure i roared we'll bring it with us said edgar 
i asked for information i demanded confidences edgar refused both i insisted that i might be allowed at least to carry my automatic pistol suppose some one tries to take the treasure from us i pointed out no one said edgar severely would be such an ass as to imagine we are carrying buried treasure in a suitcase he will think it contains pyjamas for local colour then i begged i want to say in my story that i went heavily armed say it then snapped edgar but you can't do it not with me you can't how do i know you mightn't he shook his head wearily end of part one part two of my buried treasure by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn part two it was a day in early october the haze of indian summer was in the air and as we crossed the north river by the twenty-third street ferry the sun flashed upon the white clouds overhead and the tumbling waters below on each side of us great vessels with the blue peter at the fore lay at the wharfs ready to cast off or were already nosing their way down the channel towards strange and beautiful ports lamport and holt were rolling down to rio the royal mail's magdalena no longer white and gold was off to kingston where once seven pirates swung in chains the clyde was on her way to haiti where the buccaneers came from the moro castle was bound for havana which morgan king of all the pirates had once made his own and the red d was steaming to porto cabello where sir francis drake as big a buccaneer as any of them lies entombed in her harbour and i was setting forth on a buried treasure expedition on a snub-nosed flat-bellied fresh-water ferry-boat bound for new jersey no one will ever know my sense of humiliation and when the italian boy insulted my immaculate tan shoes by pointing at them and saying shine i could have slain him fancy digging for buried treasure in freshly varnished boots but edgar did not mind to him there was nothing lacking it was just as it should be he was deeply engrossed in calculating how many offices were for rent in the singer building when we reached the other side he refused to answer any of my eager questions he would not let me know even for what place on the line he had purchased our tickets and as a hint that i should not disturb him he stuffed into my hands the latest magazines at least tell me this i demanded have you ever been to this place before to-day once said edgar shortly last week that's when i found out i would need some one with me who could dig how do you know it's the right place i whispered the summer season was over and of the chair car we were the only occupants but before he answered edgar looked cautiously around him and out of the window we had just passed red bank because the map told me he answered suppose he continued fretfully you had a map of new york city with the streets marked on it plainly suppose the map said that if you walked to where broadway and fifth avenue meet you would find the flat iron building do you think you could find it was it as easy as that i gasped it was as easy as that said edgar i sank back into my chair and let the magazines slide to the floor 
what fiction story was there in any one of them so enthralling as the actual possibilities that lay before me in two hours i might be bending over a pot of gold a sea-chest stuffed with pearls and rubies i began to recall all the stories i had heard as a boy of treasure buried along the coast by kidd on his return voyage from the indies where along the jersey sea-line were their safe harbours the train on which we were racing south had its rail hid at barnegat bay and between barnegat and red bank there now was but one other inlet that of the manasquan river it might be barnegat it might be manasquan it could not be a great distance from either towards the ocean down a broad sandy road the season had passed and the windows of the cottages and bungalows on either side of the road were barricaded with planks on the verandas hammocks abandoned to the wind hung in tatters on the back porches the doors of empty refrigerators swung open on one hinge and on every side above the fields of gorgeous goldenrod rose signs hidding for rent when we had progressed in silence for a mile the sandy avenue lost itself in the deeper sand of the beach and the horse of his own will came to a halt on one side we were surrounded by locked and deserted bathing-houses on the other by empty pavilions shuttered and barred against the winter but still inviting one to try our salt-water taffy or to keep cool with an ice-cream soda rupert turned and looked inquiringly at edgar to the north the beach stretched in an unbroken line to manasquan inlet to the south three miles away we could see floating on the horizon like a mirage the hotels and summer cottages of bay head drive toward the inlet directed edgar this gentleman and i will walk relieved of our weight the horse stumbled bravely into the trackless sand while below on the damper and firmer shingle we walked by the edge of the water the tide was coming in and the spent waves spreading before them an advance guard of tiny shells and pebbles threatened our boots and at the same time in soothing lazy whispers warned us of their attack these lisping murmurs and the crash and roar of each incoming wave as it broke were the only sounds and on the beach we were the only human figures at last the scene began to bear some resemblance to one set for an adventure the rolling ocean a coast steamer dragging a great column of black smoke and cast high upon the beach the wreck of a schooner her masts tilting drunkenly gave colour to our purpose it became filled with greater promise of drama more picturesque i began to thrill with excitement i regarded edgar appealingly in eager supplication at last he broke the silence that was torturing me we will now walk higher up he commanded if we get our feet wet we may take cold my spirit was too far broken to make a reply but to my relief i saw that in leaving the beach edgar had some second purpose with each heavy step he was drawing toward two high banks of sand in a hollow behind which protected by the banks were three stunted wind-driven pines his words came back to me so many what you may call ems were these pines the three somethings from something the what you may call ems the thought chilled me to the spine 
i gazed at them fascinated i felt like falling on my knees in the sand and tearing their secret from them with my bare hands i was strong enough to dig them up by the roots strong enough to dig the panama canal i glanced tremulously at edgar his eyes were wide open and eloquent with dismay his lower jaw had fallen he turned and looked at me for the first time with consideration apology and remorse were written in every line of his countenance i'm sorry he stammered i had a cruel premonition i exclaimed with distress you have lost the map i hissed no no protested edgar but i entirely forgot to bring any lunch with violent mutterings i tore off my upper and outer garments and tossed them into the hack where do i begin i asked edgar pointed to a spot inside the triangle formed by the three trees and equally distant from each put that horse behind the bank i commanded where no one can see him and both you and rupert keep off the skyline from the north and south we were now all three hidden by the two high banks of sand to the east lay the beach and the atlantic ocean and to the west stretches of marshes that a mile away met a wood of pine trees and the railroad round house i began to dig i knew that weary hours lay before me and i attacked the sand leisurely and with deliberation it was at first no great effort but as the hole grew in depth and the roots of the trees were exposed the work was sufficient for several men still as edgar had said it is not every day that one can dig for treasure and in thinking of what was to come i forgot my hands that quickly blistered and my breaking back after an hour i insisted that edgar should take a turn but he made such a poor headway that my patience could not contain me and i told him i was sufficiently rested and would continue with alacrity he scrambled out of the hole and taking a cigar from my case seated himself comfortably in the hack i took my comfort in anticipating the thrill that would be mine when the spade would ring on the iron-bound chest when with a blow of the axe i would expose to view the hidden jewels the pieces of eight coated with verdigris the string of pearls the chains of yellow gold edgar had said a million dollars that must mean there would be diamonds many diamonds i would hold them in my hands watch them at the sudden sunshine blink their eyes and burst into tiny burning fires in imagination i would replace them in the setting from which years before they had been stolen i would try to guess whence they came from a jewelled chalice in some dim cathedral from the breast of a great lady from the hilt of an admiral's sword after an hour i lifted my aching shoulders and wiping the sweat from my eyes looked over the edge of the hall rupert with his back to the sand-hill was asleep edgar with one hand was waving away the mosquitoes and in the other was holding one of the magazines he had bought on the way down i could even see the page upon which his eyes were riveted it was an advertisement for breakfast food in my indignation the spade slipped through my cramped and perspiring fingers and as it struck the bottom of the pit something a band of iron a steel lock an iron ring gave forth a muffled sound my heart stopped beating as suddenly as though mr corbett had hit it with his closed fist 
my blood turned to melted ice i drove the spade down as fiercely as though it was a dagger it sank into a rotten wood i had made no sound for i could hardly breathe but the slight noise of the blow had reached edgar i heard the springs of the hack creak as he vaulted from it and the next moment he was towering above me peering down into the pit his eyes were wide with excitement greed and fear in his hands he clutched the two suitcases like a lion defending his cubs he glared at me get out he shouted like hell i said get out he roared i'll do the rest that's mine not yours get out with a swift kick i brushed away the sand i found i was standing on a squat wooden box bound with bands of rusty iron i had only to stoop to touch it it was so rotten that i could have torn it apart with my bare hands edgar was dancing on the edge of the pit incidentally kicking sand into my mouth and nostrils you promised me he roared you promised to obey me you ass i shouted haven't i done all the work don't i get you get out roared edgar slowly disgustedly with what dignity one can display in crawling out of a sand-pit i scrambled to the top go over there commanded edgar pointing and sit down in furious silence i seated myself beside rupert he was still slumbering and snoring happily from where i sat i could see nothing of what was going forward in the pit save once when the head of edgar his eyes aflame and his hair and eyeglasses sprinkled with sand appeared above it apparently he was fearful lest i had moved from the spot where he had placed me i had not but had he known my inmost feelings he would have taken the axe into the pit with him i must have sat so for half an hour in the sky above me a fish-hawk drifted lazily from the beach sounded the steady beat of the waves and from the town across the marshes came the puffing of a locomotive and the clanging bells of the freight trains the breeze from the sea cooled the sweat on my aching body but it could not cool the rage in my heart if i had the courage of my feelings i would have cracked edgar over head with the spade buried him in the pit bribed rupert and for ever after lived happily on my ill-gotten gains that was how kidd or morgan or blackbeard would have acted i cursed the effete civilization which had taught me to want many pleasures but had left me with a conscience that would not let me take human life to obtain them not even edgar's life in half an hour a suitcase was lifted into view and dropped on the edge of the pit it was followed by the other and then by edgar without asking me to help him because he probably knew i would not he shovelled the sand into the hole and then placed the suitcases into the carriage with increasing anger i observed that the contents of each were so heavy that to lift it he used both hands there is no use your asking any questions he announced because i won't answer them i gave him minute directions as to where he could go but instead we drove in black silence to the station there edgar rewarded rupert with a dime and while we waited for the train to new york placed the two suitcases against the wall of the ticket office and sat upon them when the train arrived he warned me in a hoarse whisper that i had promised to help him guard the treasure and gave me one of the suitcases 
it weighed a ton just to spite edgar i had a plan to kick it open so that every one on the platform might scramble for the contents but again my infernal new england conscience restrained me edgar had secured the drawing-room in the parlour car and when we were safely inside and the door bolted my curiosity became stronger than my pride edgar i said your ingratitude is contemptible your suspicions are ridiculous but under these most unusual conditions i don't blame you but you are quite safe now the door is fastened i pointed out ingratiatingly it and this train doesn't stop for another forty minutes i think this would be an excellent time to look at the treasure i don't said edgar i sank back into my chair with intense enjoyment i imagined the train in which we were seated hurling itself into another train and everybody including edgar or rather especially edgar being instantly but painlessly killed by such an act of all-wise providence i would at once become heir to one million dollars it was a beautiful satisfying dream even my conscience accepted it with a smug smile it was so vivid a dream that i sat guiltily expectant waiting for the crash to come for the shrieks and screams for the rush of escaping steam and breaking window panes but it was far too good to be true without a jar the train carried us and its precious burden into safety to the jersey city terminal and each with half a million dollars in his hand hurried to the ferry assailed by porters newsboys hackmen to them we were a couple of commuters saving a dime by carrying our own handbags it was now six o'clock and i pointed out to edgar that at that hour the only vaults open were those of the night and day bank and to that institution in a taxicab we at once made our way i paid the chauffeur and two minutes later with a gasp of relief and rejoicing i dropped the suitcase i had carried on a table in the steel-walled fastnesses of the vaults gathered excitedly around us were the officials of the bank summoned hastily from above and watchmen in plain clothes and watchmen in uniforms of grey great bars as thick as my leg protected us walls of chilled steel rising from solid rock stood between our treasure and the outer world until then i had not known how tremendous the nervous strain had been but now it came home to me i mopped my perspiration from my forehead i drew a deep breath edgar i exclaimed happily i congratulate you i found edgar extending towards me a two-dollar bill you gave the chauffeur two dollars he said the fare was really only one dollar eighty so you owe me twenty cents mechanically i laid two dimes upon the table all the other expenses continued edgar which i agreed to pay i have paid he made a peremptory gesture i won't detain you any longer he said good night good night i cried don't i see the treasure against the walls of chilled steel my voice rose like that of a tortured soul don't i touch it i yelled don't i even get a squint even the watchmen looked sorry for me you do not said edgar calmly you have fulfilled your part of the agreement i have fulfilled mine a year from now you can write the story 
as i moved in a dazed state towards the steel door his voice halted me and you can say in your story called edgar that there is only one way to get a buried treasure that is to go and get it end of part two end of my buried treasure by richard harding davis recorded by carolyn in september two thousand and twelve in groningen in the netherlands thank you for listening